Welcome to a Victim Bites Back, show number 39, where I'm driving from Annecy in France, past Geneva and Lausanne and Bern, to Zurich, and the music of the mighty Alvin Stardust, who I produced back in the 70s. like a very quiet and rather proper place. Unfortunately, the weather seems much more like England than the south of France. It's pretty enough, full of churches and spires all over the place. Um, I'm sure it's much prettier when the sun is shining. But meanwhile, um, we look at the river, which I have to say is very nice indeed. And I think we'll go on a trip in that, uh, on the river in a few moments. But getting here took ages, of course, driving down the roads, or mainly motorways, no tolls, interestingly enough, in Switzerland, but still traffic jams. We appear to be stuck in a slight traffic jam, so if you'll excuse me waffling on whilst uh, I'm not looking at the camera all the time, because I have to watch the car in front, whenever the traffic jam is going to be over. Let me cover a couple of the things that happened last week. Spectacular legal things. The first was the trial of Kevin Spacey, at which the actor was found not guilty on all nine false allegations by all four false accusers. Now, that was a major milestone uh, for, for two separate reasons. Uh, for the British industry. Number one, the police didn't do what they normally do. And what they normally do, the British police, what Surrey police would have done, it was of course the Met Police that did it, or most of the police forces would have done before people brought the spotlight on police and started showing how bent and corrupt so many police officers were they would have found one of the guys who would have been 17 or 18 when uh, 
Kevin Spacey tried it on, which we all know he did all the time, relentlessly, and they would have persuaded them that they were actually under the age of 16 when this happened, and they would have given them evidence or would have assisted them in finding evidence that they were 15 or even 14, like that ghastly Anthony Rapp was in America. Do you remember? He claimed to have been 14 at some kind of a party when Kevin Spacey tried something on. And by the way, his claims were thrown out of court too, I believe. Um, but in Britain, it worked much better until recently. The police didn't actually dare uh, find somebody or trick somebody into doing that. Um, so that's the first interesting point. But the second interesting point is, now what will happen is, we all know the lawyers, there are so many firms of bent corrupt lawyers, and they pursue civil cases, even if somebody is found not guilty in a criminal court. And they say, ah, less evidence is needed in a civil court. And what they hit the uh, the person who is not guilty with is, look, these, uh, these victims, who weren't victims, as proven in a court of law, these victims had their lives ruined by whatever did happen. Uh, and as a result, they've lost a fortune in career opportunities that they didn't get take Anthony Rapp or Andrew Rapp or whatever the silly man's name was um, and all these people therefore will be suing the extremely wealthy and famous celebrity in this case Kevin Spacey for hundreds of thousands of pounds which because he really can't be bothered to go through it all again his lawyers will advise him expensive lawyers who make a fortune even the defense ones by the way they love making a fortune because they charge a fortune for this they will say oh look settle on the courtroom steps and he'll settle for a few thousand pounds as a few as opposed to a few hundred thousand pounds of which the civil lawyers who are called bent lawyers will collect 50 percent because of course they've done it on a no win no fee basis therefore not costing the false accusers a penny but the false accusers will end up pocketing 10 grand or 20 grand which is fine and basically the celebrity will go oh well I could afford it who cares that I think is appalling on to the second case in a moment <laughs> The 
the second case as I sit stuck in traffic but occasionally take my eyes off you because I'm watching the car in front which now appears to be moving slightly was the Andrew Malkinson case. This is far more serious and far more important. Andrew Malkinson was a man who was accused of rape and was convicted of rape on no evidence whatsoever that sexual crimes these days often get guilty verdicts with no evidence. I found this stunning and unbelievable 23 years ago when it happened to me. Even the uh, prosecution admitted there was no, technically no evidence that I'd committed any crimes of a sexual nature, which by the way, I hadn't, and I'm still appealing. Um, but uh, they, they, it, was, it was what the accusers claimed was just accepted as evidence. It's not evidence, it's one person's word against another. And sometimes the police and the prosecutors play it cleverly in that if two or three or four or five people say similar sort of stories, who mustn't take your hand off the wheel when you're driving, King, um, they actually call that corroborative evidence. So all it needs to be is they all say, and you had sex with me. And that is corroborative evidence. I'm sorry, it's actually corroborative lies in many cases. Or, as happens a lot in exaggerations, sometimes it was accurate and we did have sex, except the person was fibbing and they said they were 15 when they were actually 19 or whatever, right? But we'll move ahead from that for the moment. With the Andrew Malkinson case, he was accused of raping this woman, which he simply hadn't done. And there was so much evidence that he hadn't done it. And yet he was convicted in a court of law. And uh, as a result, he went to prison and he was sentenced to a reasonable short term in prison. I can't remember how long, but he refused to admit to having done it and therefore to go on the stupid courses they made you go on in those days, which I also refused to do. Being innocent of the convictions, why would I admit it? And he felt the same. He ended up spending 17 years in prison for crimes he simply did not commit. Now, the awful thing about this is he appealed against it in the way that you can appeal twice or I think three times. And his appeal went to this, this, this independent judgment organization set up by the government who are completely independent and therefore in a position to examine and investigate somebody's claims and to find them if they find them if they think there's a real possibility that they were innocent they can then refer it, the convictions back to the court of appeal the court of appeal then looks at it and when it's got something referred back to it nearly always absolutely agrees and the conviction is quashed as happened in the case of andrew malkinson after 17 years however the two or three times he applied to the CCRC, the Criminal Case Review Commission, before that, they rejected it. They wouldn't send it back to the Court of Appeal. Now, their story is, ah, finally, some DNA evidence that the police had mislaid or perhaps buried. Um, years before did prove he was innocent and therefore when that finally emerged not due to the CCRC looking for it by the way but how, but for an independent organization about who work on appeals and have virtually no money unless you or I give them money which incidentally I do regularly um, they found out this DNA evidence of course it proved him innocent and boom he was quashed now Everybody is saying this is marvellous and it's so good. Shocking that he spent 17 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. And especially as he's not going to be given any money or compensation for that. And in fact, the government are going to charge him money for looking after him so nicely in prison and paying for his board and lodging um, when he didn't have to pay for it himself because he was in prison. Can you believe this? It's fucking ridiculous. Anyway, leaving all that aside, the main thing this shows is 
says, the CCRC is not fit for purpose. It only sends about 1% or perhaps sometimes 2% of people who've appealed to it back to the Court of Appeal. It decides that 98% of the people who appeal are, were absolutely 100% convicted correctly and were guilty. Now that is insane. You and I know that that is insane. There have been so many cases like Malkinson proven and there are people in jail now who are innocent. They simply cannot afford to spend the fortune needed on lawyers and investigators and everything else to find the evidence of their innocence. That is what the CCRC are meant to do, but they're not doing it. They don't do it with that 98% of cases. They just reject them and that's the end of it. And the people just languish in prison for years and years. Or, as in my case, get released because I'm a good boy and everyone in the system knew I was a good boy and not guilty of the stupid convictions in 2001. So I was released after three or four years um, and I've had a very happy life since and incidentally had a very happy life inside, giving people advice on how to deal with such injustices, including getting a dozen people released on appeal, only due to my reading all their documents and papers. Anyway, that's needs saying. The Andrew Malkinson case is more important than just a guy getting off. It's, it actually really matters because of that, what it proves that the system is broken. I've got to stop now because I'm pulling out of the traffic into a single lane, which was obviously the problem, and I can now drive as normal, and God forbid I would talk whilst driving and looking at you instead of at the road. Bye-bye! <laughs>
course, is not in the EU. Uh, as a result, they have a different currency. They do not necessarily have euros. Apologies, by the way, I'm going through another fucking tunnel. Anyway, as a result, they do accept euros, but I felt I needed a few Swiss francs. So I bought myself uh, some Swiss francs on one of my credit cards or debit cards. But I was only in uh, Zurich for a couple of days, three days, four days. So as a result, uh, I found myself with a load of Swiss francs just about to cross the border back out into the EU. Uh, luckily, it dawned on me that one of the best things I was going to need was to fill up with petrol. So I did manage to stop at a Swiss petrol station just before the Austrian border and buy a hundred Swiss francs worth, which is sort of a hundred quid's worth, of petrol to fill up my Rolls Royce. Uh, I still had some money left. And so, of course, I managed to buy a few other things, like a mug, because you know I love mugs, but also, of course, by necessity, loads and loads of delicious Swiss chocolate. One of the things you won't see when I'm driving, especially on the German motorways, which I do a lot, of, and sometimes on the Italian ones, but mainly the German ones, is when uh, I'm in the one lane on a two lane motorway, uh, mainly because lorries and very slow vehicles are in the right hand lane and I'm in the left hand lane. And there's a car behind me, usually a Mercedes, quite often a BMW, who now make Rolls Royces um, in front of me, sorry, behind me, flashing their lights to get by when I truly can't get into the right lane because there's lorries there. Um, and I do eventually pull into the right lane, as actually I have a to do. And as the Mercedes or the BMW or the white car I fall by that. I would if I had both hands free also do this gesture, but I don't actually have both hands free at the same time. It annoys them beyond all measure because secretly they've been looking endlessly at my miles prettier and much faster Rolls Royce and they drive on, drive on in their horrid little tiny Mercedes Benz or vile, awful, ghastly, um, tacky BMWs, and they see me making a smelly bit inside, and presenting, whoops, we just turned it off, bye! Ow. Oh, and I forgot to mention, uh, two or three times oh. over the, uh, 60 odd years I've been driving on motorways in places like Germany and Italy. The ghastly fast beeping Mercedes Benz or horrible tacky BMW that's been flashing at me to move to one side because they want to zip fast in their much faster car. Two or three times I've then seen a few miles further on down the motorway they've been involved in a terrible accident quite often killing the driver and other uh, inmates of the car. I feel terrible for them, poor souls. They really should have driven slower. Ow!